So if we take the ideas we've been using in our regular processors, we have a computer with one processor, and it's connected to one batch of memory. Maybe there's a cache to speed things up, hopefully speed things up, and it has main memory. And now if we wanted to take a program and have the program run on multiple processors, and we'll have our processors, Let's just say for argument's sake, we have three processors now. And we wanted to take our program. Our program has some lines in it that have to be run. When we're running them on one processor, we just run start to finish, and then we're done. Now, if we could, we might not be able to always do this, but if we could divide our program into three equal sections and put one section on each processor, it looks like we could get the the program to be run in one-third the time, if we were lucky. Right? It might not be the case because maybe there's some computations that have to be done here before the ones that are done here could even start, and then that would cause us to not be able to get this, what might be called a linear speed up. So ideally, ideally what we're hoping for, if we have n processors, Our system has n processors, let's say 0, 1, and then n minus 1 processors. What we're hoping for is the more processors we have, the speed up, which would be um, the, the multiplier of how, much, how quicker it would go would be linear. So we'd be looking for something like if we had three processors, then our program could run three times quicker. That would be ideal. If, that, if, we could, if we could get that, if we could have our program run three times quicker, that would be like the ideal one. Well, actually, we might even be able to, in some ways, get even a little bit better than, um, and it usually doesn't last long, but we could almost do better than linear. Um, so first of all, we'd have to be lucky that our program could be broken up into three equal, equally sized chunks. And we would be able to distribute those among our processors. And then if we balance the work perfectly and none of the parts that we scattered them on are dependent on the other ones, we could actually do a little bit better than a linear speed up in that, so first of all, this is processors. And this would be speed up. Um, so for example, if we had a, uh, a sorting problem, uh, let's say we were doing a searching problem, we're searching a very large database. And so let's say there was an array we were searching. And we started at the beginning with one processor, and we just went looking through it until we finally find something, and then we can stop. Well, if we broke this up into equal chunks, let's say a chunk here and a chunk here, and so one-third chunks, and let's say the thing we're looking for is right here, the time it would take with one processor could be like 80% of, searching 80% of the data. Whereas the time starting three processors, one here, one starting here, and one starting here, it might not be one third of the time, it might even be a lot less than one third of the time because we well, got a little lucky, we found it kind of at the beginning here, and as soon as we find it, we can send a message to the other two processors, you can stop searching now. So that's one way we could get better than linear speed up. Um, another way might be when we talked about cache memory. Um, if each processor had its own cache, so we have a processor, we have cache memory, and then main memory. And the cache, if you remember, was put in place, sometimes processors come with this piece of hardware, a cache memory, and sometimes these are put in place so that um, we could have a better hit and miss ratio for paging reasons. So if we were to have multiple processors, and the, if the caches were the same size, 
because hardware is getting cheaper and cheaper to make, we might have a much better hit ratio. We had a second processor with its own cache. And uh, instead of one processor having one cache for the entire program, we have three processors, each with its own cache. These processors might end up having a better hit ratio, making the average instruction time quicker than in the uh, one processor case. So there's a possibility. There's a possibility we could actually do better than three, you know, linearly improving our speed. But there's a lot of things that are going to slow us down when we start to go into um, when we start to go into parallel processing or multiprocessing. So, for example, what is a, what do you, is anything you could think of that might slow us down? In other words, what we're using as our benchmark as an ideal improvement, like I say, was this linear speed up thing. But, you know, we might not be able to hit that. We might get something like that, which is still better than nothing. So this is number of processors. And speed up. So if we had an extra processes and we just went like this, there's really no gain to the extra processes. We're moving at the same speed as if we had one processor. It would be great if we could get a linear speed up. And we even realized we could get a better, slightly better than linear. But if we got something like that, that would be pretty good. Pay a little extra for hardware, but the work is coming out four, five, six times faster. Ten processors, you might get the work done eight times faster, which is great. But what are some reasons why this gap would be here? Why, what are some things that might slow things down? Well, first of all, we, we mentioned that if, um, if a computation that the second processor is doing cannot really start until the first one's done, you know, some data has to be available before we can start. This one just has to sit and wait. So that'll, that'll slow us down away from that linear value. But then what if the work that these two are doing is not 100% independent, but it's 95% independent, but they have to provide date, each processor has to provide some data to another processor. There would have to be some kind of communication from one processor to another. So how can we have communication from one processor to another? And now it's going to become a hardware design issue. So if we have if we have a processor and a second processor and then a processor down here, if these need to send a message to us and get information from one to the other, let's say if somebody one processor goes and searches for something, and if the thing is found, the another processor is supposed to do something with the found thing, and if it's not found, this processor is supposed to say, you know, it's not found, give me some new data, something like that. So the result of a computation on this processor has to be somehow received by this one. So any, any, anything you can think of? If, so if one system would be, if we had a shared memory, shared memory system, that would mean we have one piece of, one chunk of memory that all the processors have the ability to address, or read and write from. So if they're all connected to the same piece of shared memory, each processor has the ability to read and write from the memory, so it can put in its own memory address buffer. Uh, I'm sorry, memory, yeah, memory address register, the MAR. It could say I want to read or write from a particular field in memory and then it could read and write to it. The issue now is other processes can read and write from the same one. Well, reading's not a problem, it's writing. You it start to have an issue. But if we have a shared memory architecture and this process needed to get a message over to this processor, how could it do that? We put it in the memory. Right, so we could do, like, we could, this <coughs> processor could do something like execute an assembler instruction like uh, store in some A into 
registers store some value in a register register 7 and 2 some field A and then at a later time this thing says load register 3 memory location A so yeah A would be some memory location so yeah a processor can just write to memory and then at a later time this could come and pick up the value okay but that's going to now cause these process that have to be some coordination now. So somehow that have to be a signal. It would write to the field in the shared memory. We wouldn't want it to pick up the value before it got there. So then there'd have to be some kind of a signal, a message sent to this one saying, go pick it up. Okay, so there'll be like a little bit of a delay. This one might get delayed for a while, waiting for this result to be written. So that's why it's not going to work. It's, it's not all the processes, processors are going to work at full, full throttle. They might, have, they might get stalled in this message communicating. And if the, uh, suppose we decided to not use shared memory, suppose we decided to use distributed memory. So each processor, there's pluses and minuses to this, but this had, they each had their own memory. Have their own memory, and uh, suppose this is doing some. You know, we took our original program, broke it up into separate computations, but at some point, this thing needed to get a message over to this one. How could it do it? Now, let's say they're networked together. These are some network that these are all connected to. And, it, and I'm going to say it's a hardware net, network. So what I mean by a hardware network, it's not like you have a program running like Apache that send, you know, can send one message to another on a certain port and then you have a process running there that's reading it. It's just like, all we're going to say is that there's electronic wires. All of these um, processors are hardwired together, but somehow we want to be able to send a message so it's not broadcasted to every processor, it's only going to go to this one. So let's just say for now we can do that. Somehow we can steer a message from here to here. Um, what would we have to do? We'd have to somehow say, I, so I'm number zero, this is number one, this is number n minus one. So number zero has to send a message to n minus one. And then maybe it has some bit stream, some data that it wants to get there. So obviously, they, it eventually some, something that's in memory here has to end up in memory here. But we're going to have to go through our network to get there. OK, so again, there's going to be some kind of instruction here, like send data, and some kind of an, uh, procedure call here that says receive data and the data might come along this network and be put in a queue and then some receive thing will take it. But some mechanism like that has to be put in place. We'll go over that just shortly, how that can be done. And then um, the other issue that might not get us to the perfect, you know, linear, linear speed up might be the load balancing. If we have n processors, and our original program took a certain amount of time, we'd like to be able to split up the work into one nth a load for each processor. If we did that perfectly, then we might get close to the linear speed up. But if we gave one processor 50% of the work and the other ones much less work, then we're only going to get at best two times better. Because the one that's got half the work, we have to, they all have to finish before our program finishes. So we also want to make, you know, another reason to for this gap would be bad load balancing. And uh, yeah, inter-process communication. And then another one would be synchronization. And what I mean by synchronization is suppose two processors need to read or write from the same piece of data. Whether it's on a, a shared system or a different system, 
the memory that it needs to read or write from has to appear in one of the memory banks. And um, if two processors go to write to the same piece of storage, we have to somehow be able to lock one of them out and say, okay, so one, one piece of storage has the exclusive rights to that piece of memory. I'm sorry, one processor has the exclusive rights to that piece of memory, and the other one would then have to wait until the first one is completed writing to uh, that piece of memory. Then the second one could then start up. So we'll have delays there. So these are kind of the three areas where we might not get the perfect, uh, what we'd like to expect, the linear loop speed up. Uh, but instead we would get um, hopefully something close to a linear speed up. to have some kind of message passing, it would end up being yeah, like, we, like we said before, if we had a shared memory system um, for shared memory So this is like a timeline in processor 2, with time going this way. Uh, we would have something like store in store and register A, a number like 7. And that's supposed to mean something to process B. And then at some later point in time, uh, we would do a load register with A, and at this point, uh, we could say like a common register 3 is equal to 7, which is information coming from process 1. Okay, and then if we didn't have the shared memory system, and we instead had uh, distributed memory, memory system, we have process 1, process 2, and again time is going this way, going down, we'd have to do something like, we'd have to call a routine like send to process 2, A. Something that's, with some kind of message would have to be sent, saying here's the data, A could be some stream of data, and we also have to attach to the message which processor needs to receive it. At a later point in time, um, the processor who is receiving it would have to issue a receive, uh, receive message. something's coming. Now when we broke up the pro the program, we'd have to we might have to add a little extra overhead to our original project to say process one at a certain point is going to have some data it needs to send to process two. So process two we're going to have to now add some new code that says okay at this point you have to wait for processor one to complete something and wait for that to be received. So when this new command that we'd have to put in our assembler, receive from the buffer, we'd have to read something from the buffer. And then we'd have to use some kind of operating system techniques, like if the, we go to do a receive and nothing's there yet to be read, we should wait. We shouldn't receive a blank buffer and then continue processing, because well, we really need the data to continue processing. So we could use techniques like we could have a bit that says, 
Zero means the data has not arrived. One means the data has arrived. So when we issue this command, we'll have to come up with some assembler language uh, command, maybe REC or something like that. Um, what we would do is we would check the bit to see if the data is there or not, and if it's not there, we would have to use one of those operating system like semaphore routines that makes us wait until a signal comes from the sender that not only has the buffer been filled in with data, but it's ready to be received. And then once that bit is turned on, our process can wake up and receive the, the, uh, the data. Okay, so now as far as cache coherence is concerned, if we have cache memory, Suppose that we had, either this could either be memory coherence or cache coherence, but if we had a series of processors, um, and then they were each attached to some kind of memory, but I'll call it a cache. some common pool of memory. So the question is now going to become, if you get a copy of some subset of the memory, these each have a, a subset of them, if we do a write to a page here, if we make a change to a page that's in our cache, um, how do we want to handle the fact that the other caches may have the other caches may have a copy of that same page. So suppose we had a page in here. I'm using the operating system term page, but suppose we had a chunk of memory in here. A chunk of memory X. And this cache picked up a copy of X. And this page, cache picked up a copy of X. And this cache picked up a copy of X. And the idea is that these processors can process much faster out of this smaller memory than the big memory. So it's, it's reading from X, this one's reading from X, this one's reading from X, no problem. Now the issue is if one of these writes to X, if this changes, so I'm going to put X back, but you know, let me put a little marker that says, that says this one has changed. Should these processors continue to read out of the old version of X? And the answer is going to be no. We'd like to have some kind of an update, something that says these are now stale, and they'd have to somehow um, realize that those copies are no good. So a, uh, one thing we could do, well, we have a, a suggestion that's two pretty common suggestions, but any, any suggestion about as soon as one processor updates a page, we would like this processor to no longer use this one. And do something about it. So if, if it goes to read this one, it should, what should it do? So, if, well, could it, could they just then, after, like if P1 updates the memory, little memory there, right. couldn't they just update it in the main memory and then write it into it? Right, because, right, this really can only communicate directly to this one. So it can make the update here, mm -hmm. but these ones have to be somehow notified. You've got to go get a fresh copy. So, um, uh, so one thing we could do is we could mark these ones invalid.
So that way, if this processor now ever goes to read from it, it'll, it'll know this is invalid. And that could just be as simple as one bit, or maybe if we, we start having a few states, we might need a couple of bits, but one bit just to say this one's now invalid. So, but if that's the case, the, as soon as this processor wrote to this one, somehow now these caches are all communicating with each other, and we have to send it. In this case, we'd like to broadcast a message that says, if you have this page, it's now should be marked invalid. The question of whether or not, another approach might be, well, if you make the update here, make the update here, and then send a message to all of these, go get a fresh copy. But some people might argue that, well, maybe this processor and this processor may never use it again, and you're just taking up a lot of time getting a fresh copy for something it doesn't really need. So it might be better to just mark it invalid, and then if it ever goes to read it, then it'll go get a fresh copy. Plus, let's say this uh, processor was to update it over and over and over. Yeah. Then you keep telling everyone, go get a fresh copy, go get a fresh copy, and this goes on all day, and they don't even care about it. So this, this protocol might be, pro well, they, there's no right answer or wrong answer, but they all have advantages and disadvantages. So, um, so one example would be, so one, let's see, one protocol is an invalid based cache coherent protocol. So that's the case where, uh, let's call this invalid based. So we have process one, process two, process three. And process one reads a page. So the page comes in and it's going to be marked as read only. And, the, and there's no copy here. And no copy here. Okay, so again, time is going this way. So this is uh, the same time equals zero. Okay. So if the next time unit, process one, decides to read it, it'll pick up a copy. And they have a read only here. And a read only here. So this one's still okay to read it because nobody's touching it yet and there's no copy here. Now the next thing that happens is process three decides it wants to write to this copy. So not only does it load a page in, it writes to it. So it now has a write copy. Right. A writable copy. What should these ones be marked as? Are they still readable? Readable or not readable? Would they be considered readable copies? Well, now they now they'd be invalid. Yeah, they now they're they become no copy. So I guess in this protocol, no copy is the same as invalid. Okay. So yeah, I think okay. Uh, so no copy. And obviously, this processor had to send some kind of a broadcast message. I've written to it, so mark your versions invalid. And then, if um, processor two decided to read this page, <coughs> it would have to go out to the main memory and pick up the most recently written one. And then this would be no copy. Even though it may have a copy in its cache, but that copy's no good. This wants to have, get a readable copy, so it read one, and then this became readable, a read only. And does this one stay writable, or is this now considered readable only? So readable ended up meaning, a read only, sorry, ended up meaning each one of these processors has a copy, but the only thing you're allowed to do, <coughs> um, unfettered by anybody else, is to read. As soon as you write, all the other ones have to be marked as no copy. So now that this one did a read, read it, only, yeah, then this one becomes read only too. So if you're in the read only state, it means you can read out of that page, but as soon as you write to it, 
you have to broadcast to all the other processors my value, you know, mine is the freshest and yours is now out of date. <coughs> and then if we did the kind where, another way we could do it, and it really just depends on your application, what's the better, what's the best way to do it, would be the uh, update based. update based one so we would have no copies all over the place okay so I'm just going to say no copy no copy no copy and then let's say process one wants to write it so process one would get a writable copy this would be a no copy and a no copy if process two wants to read from the page, it then gets a writable copy. This one stays writable, this one stays writable, and this one is no copy. So what this is now saying, the only real difference is, last time we would have made both of these read-onlys, now, they're both kind of in the read-only mode, but the first one to write it will then have to cancel out everybody else. So they're both considered writable copies. Then, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In this case, when process, okay, sorry. When, when process two got a copy, Instead of it being they both become readable, they're both writable. Each one has the most up-to-date version, and the next one to write to it will have the most recent one, but it will then broadcast a message saying, the message is not going to be your copy's out of date. The message is going to be, here's the brand new copy of it. So they'll all have the latest. Anyone who's, who's in writable mode will have the latest version of it. So now, if process three wants to do a write and process one and two have readable cop uh, writable copies and this one actually goes and does a write it will not only write to the page but it'll broadcast to these two here's the updated version of it and all three now have a writable copy and it pretty much would stay writable at that point on so like a fourth step could be uh, process two reads from the uh, page, and all three just stay in their writable state. But in either case, we're sending messages around based on who's reading and writing from the page. Okay, then another protocol would be to not do it on a per page basis, but maybe on a per line basis. And it's a protocol that basically says, um, it's called the M-E-S-I, which stands for Modified Exclusive Shared and Invalid. So we're gonna we could we could record this with just four bi uh, two bits, right? If we decided this is double zero, this is zero one, this is one, one zero one. zero, and this is one one. Doesn't really matter. But every so what we can now do is take like every line or every word in our cache, because we don't really have to. We don't have to broadcast the entire page like a meg of data every time someone changes one line. If we just change one line, we can have each line have a setting, whether it's been modified, whether it's shared. Shared meaning it's readable to anybody. Invalid means it's no good. You have to go get a fresh copy. Um, the distinction between exclusive and modified is, uh, let's see. So. The shared state means that the process, uh, let's, let's write one down, shared. So if your line in the cache or word, you could break it up on a, 
per byte or word. Or, but the more you break it up, the more of you're going to need these two bits for that section. So the smaller, the less likely you have to do updating across the network, but the larger, the, but the smaller, the more bits are being used as metadata. So you're losing the size of the cache. So shared means that the processor has a copy of that line or word and that one or more other processes have a copy. So a processor has, the processor has a copy and one or more other other P's have it. So it's in shared mode. So if you're in shared mode and you go to write to it, you have to somehow send a message to the other ones. Okay. Okay, so exclusive. The exclusive state, the processor is the only one with a copy, but has not written to it. state means that the processor is the only one with a copy and it has written to it. So the only one with a copy and it's been modified. And then invalid is the only one left. The copy's no good, right? P's copy. Then you'd have to get a new one. So if you had a copy that was in shared, that means you're as up to date as anyone else. Um, you can read from it. But if somebody was to go to the modified state on that same line that you have in your cache, modified means they modified it, you would have, yours would have to become marked as invalid, right? Because your shared version, which is like the previous one, is a read-only copy. Since it's been modified, yours would have to become invalid. So that line, or word, or sentence, or small chunk of the cache, its value gets set to invalid. So when a, when a processor modifies a line in a cache, it has to broadcast out to all the other processors a message saying that this particular line, if you have this line, mark it invalid. Um, if you had an exclusive copy, meaning you're the only one, and you modified it, so that's really the point of this extra st step. You might think these could be collapsed into one, modified and exclusive. But if you have an exclusive copy, you don't have to broadcast a message around because you're the only one that has it. So if you have an exclusive copy and you modify it, then it, go it just becomes modified. You don't have to send it out to anybody. And then if it's modified, you have to send out a message to uh, the other processes. Okay. Um, okay, and then as far as communication to the other processes, I mean, this could be, you know, could do a whole couple of lectures on this. How do, how do, these, proce how do these processors communicate to each other? And we want it to, to happen at really quick speed, like at hardware speed. We don't want to run through software of like sending a message and connecting to a network and then having someone receive the message. But if we had, uh, let's say we had eight processors. So 
I'm at zero, one, all the way down to, let's say, eight. Let's say the number of processes we have is always a power of two. Because we like things to be a power of two in hardware because it makes the wiring very easy. So if we wanted to send a message from processor one over two, so I'm really drawing the same processors again over here. Um, so this is really time. I'm sorry, this is zero to seven. Zero to seven. If I, so time is going this way. We're not adding processors. These are our processors, and then a little bit of time later, here's the same processors. But if we wanted to send a message to from processor one to processor seven, and we'd like those bits to get there as quickly as possible, what can we do? So between these processors, we have a connection. And what's the quickest way that we could get? We have, let's say we have a bunch of bits, 100 bits, we need to send from this processor to this processor. And we'd like to get them there as quickly as possible. But we don't want the bits being broadcast to all. Well, maybe we do. Actually, some of the examples we don't know if we want to broadcast all of them. And sometimes we just want to send a message to one of them. So how could we do that? So suppose we had 100 bits we wanted to send. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, blah, blah, blah. And it needs to go to message, uh, it needs to go to processor 7. What could we do as far as hardware is concerned? That we can just send out a message into some kind of a network and it'll get routed there. Uh, well, yeah, like I say, we, I, we, we could go on in hardware how to do this, but we could use a couple of bits, like let's say, the identifier, 111, we'll just make, well, I'm sorry, we'll make the message a little bit bigger, put a 111 in front of it, meaning the first three bits tell us where it's going. We could have a connection that says something like, if the first bit is a, if the first bit coming out is a uh, 1, I'm sorry, if the first bit coming out is a zero, um, then this line will have data coming out. And if the first bit coming out is a one, this line will have data coming out. So this could be just something powering these off, turning these on and off. And if the first bit is on, this could get latched into a D flip-flop, which now becomes memory and just kind of stays on for the rest of the day. So if the first bit is 1, then all data coming out after it come through this pipe and nothing comes through here, zeros come through here. Then we could do the same thing for the second bit. Um, we could do a 0 and a 1. And then again for the third bit, a zero and a one. And then if the first three bits that came through, these stages, so there'd be logarithmic many stages. If we had eight processors, we would need three stages. But the first three bits of the message could determine out of all eight paths to go, out of, I'm sorry, out of all the other seven processors to go to, and we could also wire ourselves back into ourselves, but it would be kind of strange if we had to send a message to ourselves. But we could say for the first three bits, could determine through the network which of the one of the seven other processors is the one that's going to have the remaining bits, these bits, flow through to it. And then we'll shut off all the bits to the other ones. So it's not like, I mean, obviously we could do this using a computer network. We could say, I'm processor zero, I'm sending a message to processor seven and send it through like TCP IP to get it over there. But that's software, and software's going to take a lot longer. We want to do computations and very quickly get a message sent over. So we could just dedicate a certain number of bits to determine which processor it goes to. It's kind of nice if the number of processors you have is a power of two, because the bits are, you know, three bits could be used to tell which one of the other seven processors, and four bits would be 15 other ones, and so on. So yeah, like I say, I mean, we could come up with hardware to connect these networks together, and there's different kinds of mesh networks that we can talk about. We can talk about it in our next class.